I think I failed to introduce myself when I um, introduced the afternoon keynote speaker. My name's Chip Levengood, and I'm the chairman of U.S. Vote and Overseas Vote Foundation. We are happy to have all of you here, and we're going to be talking about the subject which got OVF started about 10 years ago, which is uh, UOCAVA voters. But I'm truly honored to be able to introduce uh, Professor Don Inbody of Texas State University, who is going to be the moderator and was the organizer of this uh, this particular part of the program. Don serves in the uh, political science department at Texas State and teaches a variety of courses. He said he's kind of their, their go-to guy for whatever has to be taught and is interestingly now teaching a course which is trying to inspire the students at Texas State to actually become voters. And so I think, you know, that's uh, a really interesting thing that he's doing. Uh, but really, he's here because he's a national authority on UOCAVA voting, a leading national authority. I, I, I shouldn't uh, shortchange him. And um, for this purpose, I think he's just the right guy to lead this thing. But his background is not the normal academic's background. Um, and his background makes him particularly well-suited to the, um, the job of moderating a panel on UOCAVA voting because he spent... 28 years on active duty in the U.S. Navy, including a series of command positions, so he has the military part of uh, UOCAVA down pat. But then after retiring from the military, Don went and got a Ph.D. in political science, and um, so therefore he has the academic side of this to bring the two pieces together. Um, he received his Ph.D. in political science doing research about the experiences of, um, military of military members in voting. And he found a very interesting conclusion, and um, I'll just try to summarize it if I can. He basically found that if you look at the socioeconomic strata of various members of the military, they voted very similarly to the way that that same socioeconomic strata voted in the civilian population. And that may give some insights into um, how, how um, to attract military voters if you're a candidate. Um, he's actually been a UOCAVA voter himself. Um, once successfully, he told me, and once unsuccessfully. And I guess the unsuccessful was probably because some of the barriers that the MOVE Act has hopefully attacked caused him to not get his ballot back in time to be counted. And so as a former UOCAVA voter, as um, someone who understands the military, someone who studied UOCAVA voting as an academic, I can't think of a better person to, um, to do this. He will have a book coming out on the history of military voting in the next 12 months, and I urge you all to buy multiple copies as Christmas presents or whatever. <laughs> Christmas is coming. And without any further ado, I'm happy to uh, hand the, the panel over to Don. Well, thank you. Uh, we're here today to talk about the state of the military and civilian overseas voter, UOCAVA voters. Um, like Chip said, this was something that kicked this series of summits off many years ago. And it's a subject that has had an awful lot of study on it. Now, he said I was one of the leading scholars on it. Uh, probably not, but only because what I found is that there are very few of us that are doing that. that that's, so I'm, I'm big fish in a little pond, I guess. But I think the part that he mentioned there at the end is the one of, let's, do we understand the military voter? Do we understand the overseas civilian voter? And as you'll learn here, these are distinct populations. So imagine this, three people. And, and through our conversation today, think of these three people. The name is irrelevant, but Lance Corporal Jones, stationed at a forward operating base in Afghanistan. Sergeant Sanchez, California, or a Texas resident, stationed at Camp Pendleton in California. And Anita Miller, civilian, businesswoman, from California, living in Berlin. So imagine those three different populations and, and, and how some of these things, those different circumstances uh, apply differently to them, to these barriers that we have. Now, to help us out here today in, in examining these barriers to voting, which is uh, the term that 
that we in the field have used is right now we don't think there's anybody out there actively trying to prevent military and overseas voters from voting. I don't think there's anybody out there making that happen, although it used to be the case. But there's still very practical barriers. And so here to help us talk about this is Jack Klimp. He's the president of the National Association of Uniform Services. He's going to kind of give us a sense of kind of report from the field, if you will. What, what, are, the, what are the military folks out there saying? And then over here, Matt Bomer, director of the Federal Voting Assistance Program. If you don't know what the Federal Assistance Voting Program is, uh, look it up. Uh, that's part, you got to know that. That's just part. But anyway, it's the, the part of the federal government, of course, which is assigned the responsibility of sorting out and overcoming these barriers for our overseas and military voters. The Overseas Vote Foundation very generously uh, gave me the services of uh, Judy Murray. She's been doing some research. And she's here very much to say all these overseas voters aren't the same. She's going to talk to you about the civilians in particular, although she talks about a lot of other things, too. They're helpful. And then, of course, as many of us forget, you can't vote in an election in the United States, even for president, unless you're the resident of a state and registered to vote in a state someplace. There's no such thing as being a registered U.S. voter. You have to be a registered voter in a state someplace. And as a result, essentially all of our election law is written at the states. To help us with that, um, Kamanzi Khaleesi is going to help us um, look at that from the state level. He is with the uh, Overseas Voting Initiative from the, National, or from the uh, Council on State Governments. Is that right? And so he's going to talk about what are the unique problems that states are seeing in trying to execute the UOCAVA, HAVA, uh, MOVE Act, and all these other issues that are going on. And then just back from California, having poured through all the data provided by FVAP and all the other studies about these recent elections, is that David Merman is going to say, OK, I hear what all you guys are saying, but here's what the data says. He's going to help us ground us in some of that. And I think that's going to be fascinating. And take notes, because it hadn't been released yet, if I'm correct. He's well, he's not going to give you any secrets. <laughs> Don't do that. But, but, you know, this is hot off the presses kind of stuff. And then, you know Rob. And uh, he's got some, some ideas, because some, a very unique situation that overseas and military people have in terms of how to participate fully in the entire scope of the election. He's got a, a one very specific proposal and initiative that he's going to talk about at the end. So let's start with the general here. What's, what's it like for Lance Corporal Jones over there in the FOB and he wants to vote? What, 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 what does he see out there? Well, let me, uh, let me start by talking about both of those gentlemen that you mentioned, the Lance Corporal at the FOB and the Sergeant uh, at Camp Pendleton. Uh, and, and I think the way to do that is to, is to talk about my experiences as a Marine for an active duty Marine. I'm still a Marine, once one, always one, but for 33 years. Um, I'm a Michigan resident, I, or not anymore, I was then a Michigan resident. Uh, I was never stationed in Michigan for the 33 years I was in the Corps uh, on active duty. And so I voted every time as a, as a uh, what do you call it, um, an a mail-in. Uh, a voter, if you will. Um, in order to do that, every year, and we were an active, uh, politically active family, and that we voted every time, and my parents would have kicked me someplace in the backside had I not voted routinely. But to do that, I had to contact my parents by letter every year, because uh, we didn't have cell phones and all that sort of thing, and say, What's up this year? What elections are coming up locally? What elections do we have in the, in the county? What elections do we have in the state? What are the federal elections that are going on? And who's running and who stands for what? And so they'd feed this information to me by mail. Then I would have to write, we were from Utica, Michigan. Uh, it's a suburb of Detroit. I'd have to write the city clerk uh, prior to each one of those elections and request a ballot. And then once the ballot arrived, it was usually a styrofoam pad with a um, a card on top of it that you push the little holes through. I'd do that and then send it back in. Uh, and I had to do that. I don't recall that I had to re-register to vote. I think as long as I voted routinely, I, remain, I retained my registration as a voter. But for every election, whether it was state, whether it was county, city, federal, I had to go through that process. So I'm a captain. At one point, this would have been about 1977, 78, uh, I was aboard ship out in the Pacific with the 31st Mile Marine Amphibious Unit. 
and we pulled into Hong Kong, and I got you know, the usual letter from my parents and found out that they had redistricted my home, and so where I had been in the city of Utica, I was now in, our home was in the township of Sterling Heights. So then I had to research through my parents primarily, who do, who do I now ask for my ballot from? And it turned out to be the county clerk for the county of Sterling Heights. So then I had to go, and then I did have to demonstrate that I had been a registered voter in Utica, Michigan. Now I needed to be a registered voter in Sterling Heights, and would you please send me my ballot? And I was at sea most of the time. I got my ballot. Um, whether or not that ballot ever got counted, I don't have a clue. And for that matter, in 33 years of voting in that way, I don't know if any of my ballots got back in time in order to be counted. So the problems and the challenges that I experienced as a, as a military voter are essentially the challenges that that young Lance Corporal and that young sergeant experience even today. I think to a lesser degree because of technology and because of the MOVE Act and all the things that have been done to improve their ability to cast their vote, that 1% that you know, defends this country every year. But their, their challenges were, are essentially what mine were, and their access, awareness of the system, uh, timeliness and timing of getting the requests in and back and forth, and the complexity of the system. Let me start with the young Lance Corporal out on the, on the forward operating base. He's probably not in a forward operating base. He's probably in an outpost somewhere, a platoon size or a company size outfit of anywhere from 50 Marines to 110, 120 Marines, okay? So they're not in a forward operating base, they're in, a, in, a, in an outpost. Their job is to close with and destroy the enemy and to get home alive. That's what they're focused on. That's what their job is. They probably don't have a voting assistance officer with them out there. He's back, if they even have one, back at the battalion command post somewhere, and it's probably a young lieutenant, you know, who's on his first tour of duty in the, uh, in the Marine Corps and has been to a one-day school on how to help his Marines cast their vote. And there are 50 states out there, and I don't know how many counties and how many cities, all of which have different voting rules and voting regulations and voting procedures and all that. That's why his manual is 480 some odd pages, pages long out there. He's also, this Lance Corporal, is probably about 19 years old. So he's in the demographic of those who are least likely in the United States to vote to begin with. So the likelihood that that young man is going to be able, is one, going to try to vote, and then two, get his ballot out there and back in time in order for it to be counted is very, very small. The sergeant at Camp Pendleton isn't much different. Okay? He's from Texas. I'm from Michigan. Okay? I commanded a battalion of 825 Marines, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, at Camp Pendleton when I was a lieutenant colonel. I had every state in the Union, every, uh, what do you call them, Puerto Rico and Guam Territory and all, I mean, every, yeah. everything that <laughs> could cast a boat in the United States was in my battalion, and that poor young lieutenant had to be able to advise every one of them as to how to go about getting their ballot and then casting their ballot. Um, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, with this young sergeant that you're probably talking about, is in the finest battalion in the Marine Corps, is now <laughs> about 40. It, Pendleton is a huge, huge base. It's essentially the, the uh, open ground, if you will, the undisturbed uh, ground between San Diego and Los Angeles. I mean, it's that big. Uh, it's something like 40 miles from the camp where 35 is currently located to main side where the installation voting assistance officer is. The likelihood that that sergeant's going to make that trip just to come in and see the voting assistance officer is probably relatively small. He may not even have the time to do that. When I commanded 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, I had the battalion for 22 months. In that 22 months, we deployed to Bridgeport, California for 35 days of cold weather training. We deployed to 29 Palms, California for another 30 to 40 days of live fire training before we deployed. We deployed to Okinawa and from Okinawa on to Korea and to the Philippines. We were in the field constantly for, for the two years that I, I had that battalion. So the likelihood that that sergeant's going to find a time to go back and find that voting assistance officer and get that assistance is probably relatively small. So the challenges that, that I faced as a military voter 
uh, are essentially the same challenges that these young Marines out there face today, soldiers, sailors, airmen, for that matter, in casting their vote, whether they're overseas or whether they're, or they're, whether they're back in the States. So, Matt, FVAP was formed back in 1955 and has been trying to overcome just exactly what he's talking about. What, what's going on now that, that tries to lower those barriers? Yeah, and the general's right. Um, and as Don mentioned um, earlier, you know, the FAP stands for the Federal Voting Assistance Program. And that's exactly what we're here to do. And it's about this whole idea of assistance. Um, there are some people out there that actually think that uh, FAP is involved with election administration. Um, and we're not. Um, we assist. Um, are you a Kava voter, both our military personnel as well as our overseas citizens, to navigate that process? Um, state and local election officials run elections. They're in charge of the operations and the security of elections. Um, our job is to help our voters, and we facilitate that process between a voter and election official. Um, but the challenges that the general mentioned are, are absolutely real, um, and that's why we exist. Um, and our assistance tools and the tools and products that um, we produce uh, for our voters are those that are trying to address those challenges. Um, and I'm really proud of those resources. We have come a long way, um, not only um, through um, the, legis the legislative avenue, um, but also just from technology and common sense. Um, and I'm really happy to be part of a program um, that really is focusing on this idea of assistance. When we at the federal level can focus in on something and say, okay, your job is assistance. I think we can do that pretty well, and I think we've started looking at um, using you know, our website. We redesigned the website, made it way more user-friendly for all of our different audiences. Um, and we know, and even through our research uh, with, with David and our own research, we know that people who find FAP.gov and who find one of our department resources are better off navigating this crazy process that the general described. Um, and it is crazy. Um, I know I've spoken to this audience before, and I like to, to tell the story of, you know, when we all are voting in our communities, everything is the same. The candidates are the same. The rules are the same. We're all talking about this as one community. But when you take a look at the military community, um, and you've got, um, you know, a sergeant from Mississippi, you know, Lance Corporal from California, um, you've got people in one unit who live and work together who are all a part of America in terms of our states and territories. All of them have to follow d different rules. And so that adds to the confusion. And again, we talk about that voting assistance guy that you mentioned. Um, what we're actually trying to do now is even work with states as we, we come upon this 2016 election cycle. How can we reduce the volume of information that we're giving to our voters? How can we make that language more plain, simple, easy to understand? Not only because of these voting assistance officers, who, by the way, are trying their best. You know, these guys are, for the most part, doing a great job. And I know that we probably all could tell stories of the one or two unit voting assistance officers who may not be doing that great job. But we know, for the most part, and you guys in this room um, all agree with this, that we will do um, and go above and beyond for our military members. We want to make sure that this, this population in particular, because of what they do, has every single opportunity to vote. And I know this for a fact because I've talked to you guys, especially the election officials who call our voting assistance center, um, which by the way, when you call the 1-800 number, you're actually calling the Federal Voting Assistance Program office. Our staff is there answering these phone calls. Um, and we're actually on the phone with you. And you're saying, hey, listen, I got this undeliverable back. Can you help me? Um, and so we'll help, help you track this down. So we know that you go the above and beyond um, what is required of you. And same, the same thing for our unit voting assistance officers. But we want to make sure that we can make this process not only simple for them, but also simple for our voters. Because now, with this new technology that we're talking about, the same information that populates that voting assistance guide is actually going to populate the information on our website. So when it changes on the website, it'll automatically change in the voting assistance guide. So we really are talking about meshing that information together for the first time. So we want to make sure that this information is clear and simple as possible. So we just started for the first time with our outreach to the states saying, hey, listen, we're going to do this process differently. And so far, we've gotten great reactions from our state contacts saying, yes, we're willing to work with you to make sure that it's not all legal language, that our voter can come in and, and understand that. 
So our role at the federal level is to create these resources and programs that assist and facilitate. Particularly, we know that awareness of these resources that I'm so proud of, we know that the awareness of these resources are low. So what can we do to, to, to help that out? You know, coming up with effective communications campaigns. Um, I'll talk later about a, you know, a new communications campaign um, aimed at this younger first time voting, uh, voting um, audience. You heard it this morning. These younger folks are different, you know, and we need to communicate differently to them. Um, we can't expect an 18 year old um, who comes into the military to know about voting. We know that that's not emphasized um, throughout school. We talked this morning, and it was great to hear about you know, the scouts and letter writing and taking kids to the voting polls, but we know that's not the norm. So what do we have to do to operate to make sure that these younger first-time voters have a successful experience the first time they vote so that then when they do it again, they know that they have, the odds are going to be there in their favor. Um, there is this idea, as I close, that um, we call it a, a, a closed communication loop, and we know that this is something that our UACAVA audience is craving, um, and this would have to be something that the states agree to. Um, when we order something online from Amazon or you order your shoes from Zappos, there is this constant communication about where things are in the process. Your shoes are on the way. You know, if you get your shoes, you don't like your shoes, you can return your shoes. Here, just put this label on and, and ship it back. Um, it's just all about communication. And I think David will probably touch upon this later, but our audience, our military personnel, and our overseas citizens are craving for this. We got your registration request. We got your ballot request. We got your ballot. So they're craving for that. So that's one of the things that um, as we form our relationship and continue on with the Council of State Governments, and I know that Kamanzi will be talking about that as well. So thank you again for this opportunity. Let me give you a little sense of scale. We've been talking about this military population, young population. Uh, there's about 1.4 million on active duty. If you count the Guard and Reserves, there's another million, million and a half on that. Of that, 66% of that population is under the age of 30. That's precisely the population that tends to not vote anyway. So this redoubles right. the and, mo and mostly male. Right. Um, and I know that there are people in this room who have children in that age range. Um, and when you talk about voting, that's one thing. But let's add on top of that, let's add absentee voting on top of that, which requires mm -hmm. our Yuakava citizens to do things right. early and proactive. Getting somebody to make a bed on time is, is one thing, but getting them to fill out forms and think about this process early is something that we're taking seriously at FAP and trying to, right. um, trying to solve. So let's, let's jump over here to Judy. Now, we've spent a lot of time talking about this military crowd, and we're all concerned about them, but those aren't the only people covered by UOCAVA. And despite the fact that Matt works for the Secretary of Defense, he's still responsible for all these non-DOD employees that are out there in the world having to vote. Judy, tell us a little bit about that population and maybe some things that people aren't quite aware of. Well, one of the things I think that is really unique about the Overseas Vote Foundation is that um, we have this great set of time series data that we've collected over the last six election cycles um, that has captured demographic data on primarily the overseas civilian population. And um, that population looks very, very different than the military population. And I think, I'm sure, it causes issues for the FEAP in terms of how to handle that population. But the fact that the FE FEAP is actually the point of contact, the official point of contact for uh, overseas voter information, is also a very strange sort of marriage. Um, because as overseas civilians, we don't necessarily think we need to contact the DOD <laughs> to, find, <laughs> to get information about how to vote. So um, there's kind of a disconnect there as well. But um, there's several things that um, have emerged from our survey data that are kind of repetitive themes that um, have persisted in terms of problems with overseas voting for, for um, overseas civilians. And a couple of them are really um, items that come from the MOVE Act. I think they're actually sort of unintended consequences of the MOVE Act. And one of them is the use of the federal postcard application. Um, for those of you who don't know, the federal postcard application now is actually a registration and a ballot request form that should be submitted every election cycle. 
Um, primary, or previously to the MOVE Act, um, the FPCA was good for two election cycles. But what's happened is that um, implementation of that um, process across the states is not standardized. So some states are um, adhering to pre-MOVE Act standards and allowing people not to submit an FPCA. Some aren't. So what we saw in this past survey um, was that people didn't get ballots because they thought they were already registered, they didn't submit FPCAs, and so it, you know, as a consequence they weren't able to vote. So that's one issue. Let me break in. Mm -hmm. It's a big deal. Uh, the last EAC data that we've seen is states are reporting to us that as, as many as one-third of their mailed out absentee ballots to these UOCAVA voters get returned as undeliverable. Well, and I think that was probably perhaps the, the intention right. of that, yes. um, yeah. that um, in the MOVE Act, that line <clears throat> item, um, was to almost sort of act as a registration purge, if you will, to, uh, because mm -hmm. there's an, a thought that the overseas civilian population is a highly mobile population, when in fact our data actually doesn't suggest that. Um, our data suggests that the overseas civilian population is extremely stable, with the majority of our respondents noting that they've lived in whatever country of residence that they live in for 10 years or greater. So um, again, I think there's some assumptions that are being made about the overseas civilian population that uh, are incorrect, however they might apply more appropriately to the military population. Um, an, another item that has been a reoccurring problem, um, which I think also is um, an unintended consequence of the MOVE Act, was um, the um, state voter lookup tools. Um, the MOVE Act actually um, encouraged states to implement technology to allow voters to be able to look up their registration status. Um, and most voters that we've surveyed don't even know that those tools <coughs> exist. So there's a um, Again, a communication problem, and I think, Matt, you've touched on that, that people don't know about these tools. Um, but again, the problem is how do we communicate with an overseas pop population who we don't know how many there are, we don't know where they live. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge challenge. Yeah, huge and, challenge. and Judy and I were, 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 were talking about this earlier, and one of the, the benefits from the military standpoint is um, we know how to reach out to our military members. We actually know where they are. Um, so no matter the state rules, for example, for the, you know, the federal postcard application, you're right, they, are, they vary. Some are doing pre-move, some are doing one calendar year. Um, what we end up doing is communicating to all of our military members and all of our voters, including our overseas citizens, mm -hmm. that we encourage them to submit a new FBCA every January and then most importantly, every time they move. Mm -hmm. um, but we're able to reach out because we know that audience. And one of the challenges um, that we're working at at, at FAP, and I'm continuing this, um, this research has been going on um, prior to my coming to FAP, um, is, can, is there a way for us to, to figure out how many citizens there are living overseas and how to locate them? So not only would we be able to come up with a, a, a survey for this group, but that we would actually be able to communicate with them and send them communications. So this is a challenge, obviously, that we're going to be working on. And it shows, you know, again, not only our commitment to, to military members, but our overseas citizens as well. Yeah. And, I mean, actually identifying the overseas civilian population is a really difficult problem because there are most likely other issues um, that probably get in the way of overseas Americans that wanting to identify themselves that just simply can't be disentangled. Um, and so, you know, frankly, some people want to go overseas and become absent. <laughs> so, you know, and, and so um, it's just so very difficult. Um, I want to raise one other point, though, um, and again, this is a problem that we've seen recurring on our survey data. And I bring this up because these are actually structural problems that perhaps could um, be addressed somehow. Um, but there is another mechanism by which overseas voters can vote if they do not receive their ballots from their local election officials, and that's the federal right and absentee ballot. And it's basically an emergency ballot. And um, regretfully, we find that um, most voters, the majority, are not even aware of this ballot. And um, it's, it's a difficult apparatus. Um, FWEBs have the highest rejection rate. Um, it, I know um, election officials, I'm 
guessing maybe don't really like the F web all that much. <laughs> and and um, <Yes>. yeah, <laughs> and, we, we found um, that to be true. <laughs> yeah, and and it's difficult, but um, there needs to be some kind of a mechanism though that um, overseas voters have in order to exercise their right to vote um, if they so choose uh, in the event that they don't receive their ballot. So perhaps there's another way. I, I don't know, but for right at the moment, this is what we have, but nobody seems to really know yeah, about the, it. The FWAB poses a particular problem uh, just from a pragmatic point of view. I was talking with uh, Jackie Callan, my, my, my girlfriend in San Antonio who runs the election office down there. No, she's not really my girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> I know her so well and I see her a lot and I say, how many of these FWABs did you get? She knows exactly. How many get rejected? She knows exactly. I said, why were they rejected? She said, they weren't registered to vote. Mm -hmm. They assume that mm -hmm. the person, oh my gosh, the election is next week. So they grab an FWAB, they fill it out, and they send it in. And then, you know, my friend from Travis County gets that, and what can you do with it? You can't do anything with it. Mm -hmm. It's a piece of trash at that point. You can't. So that's a big problem. Now, come on, Z. <coughs> The federal government did these wonderful things and created FVAP and passed UOCAVA and passed HAVA and passed the MOVE Act, and then they toss it in the state's laps to get this sorted out. <laughs> what are you hearing back from the states? Because at the end of the day, it's state election law that drives all of this stuff. So what are you hearing back sure. from them? So short answer, the states are generally comfortable with what the federal laws are mandating them to do. Very comfortable with that. <coughs> Just some background, some context. So I represent the Council of State Governments. Specifically, I'm directing an um, overseas voting initiative for four years with the Department of Defense. And what we're going to do is we're going to develop best practices for states to use in terms of improving the process for military and civilian overseas voters. And I tell my friends quite often that I'm in a really good place right now because um, CSG is the only member organization with governors, um, state legislators, and state judges. And I'm constantly bombarded with emails, whether it's a Democrat, whether it's a Republican, independent, whether they're from the West or they're from the South, they all want to help military voters. So unlike my other colleagues who are in energy and transportation, those issues can be quite contentious. Uh, overseas voting, there's a lot of support in the states for improving the process. So what I do more specifically is I manage two um, programs. One is a uh, policy group and a technology group. And these are 20 election administrators, very, very experienced. Uh, they represent UOCAVA jurisdictions, uh, heavy UOCAVA jurisdictions. So a lot of administrators, secretaries of state and election division directors from Texas, from Florida, uh, from New York, from California, from Illinois. And a lot of these jurisdictions have done some really innovative things to improve the process. And most importantly, there is one metric that we really focus on, is that's absentee ballot rejection rates. And some of these jurisdictions that we focus on and that we consult with and we discuss uh, with constantly, they have very low absentee ballot rejection rates. So putting that all together, uh, having them, having election administrators, having states to, to weigh in on what they think are the problems, we've kind of, and this has been going on for about a, less than a year, there are four areas of concern. One area is communications, and uh, Director Bomer and everyone's kind of talked about that, communicating to this universe because of the distance. Even with accessibility on the internet, there's still some overseas voters are at a disadvantage compared to their stateside. Uh, counterparts with respect to, to information. That's just a fact. So how can you present that in very plain language? How can you notify them not only about if a ballot is rejected, but if your ballot is accepted, keeping them constantly involved in the process? Uh, also, the treatment of federal postcard applications, because in most cases, that's the only piece of paper that links an overseas voter with their local election administrator, and making sure that there's some sort of standardized treatment uh, for that. Uh, and two other areas of concern are online voter registration. Right now we have about 20 states who subscribe and actually have developed online voter registration systems. They're very efficient, very cost effective, and we, a lot of states are encouraging the use, and this will increase and increase and increase. But also a big challenge, and this is probably just, a, this is really an American problem, just our decentralized system. Some states, for instance, Georgia, um, they will actually track what they will actually track that absentee ballot is rejected, but not the reason. Other states do it differently. So, some states categorize their UOCAVA voters very differently. So, just pushing some sort of standardized uh, reporting, um, tracking for this universe is very important. And lastly, sample ballots. Again, I can't beat it in the ground <coughs> more. I can keep doing it on and on, but the overseas voters are really at a disadvantage compared to their stateside counterparts. And in some cases, they don't know all of the ballots 
propositions, all of the candidates outside of the federal races, and just keeping them informed when they're communicating, when election administrators are communicating with this universe about what's going to be on their ballot, just for good preparation. And so those are four areas in which we are, we are focused on. Uh, those don't seem like really big things, but those those are really those things make the difference at the margin, and so at the end of this year we will push um, a finalized kind of very comprehensive best practices guide that will be pushed to governors again and state legislators, so they can reference it and they can push it and they can improve the process. I just if I could interject something mm -hmm. here, sure. Um, it's interesting what you said about ballots and initiatives and things like that that overseas voters are at a disadvantage. But not only that, but um, UOCAVA only guarantees overseas voters the right to vote in federal right. elections. So there's also a lot of confusion that we've documented in the Overseas Vote Foundation surveys that um, voters are expecting to get one type of ballot, but they get something else. Um, they get state candidates and th you know, things that they're not expecting, or vice versa. And so um, I think um, you know, there's obviously a disconnect there. Um, and, and again, it gets down to the 10,000 election jurisdictions that are operating completely differently um, in the overseas world. So it would be lovely to have that standardized so that everybody knew what they were going to be getting. Well, let's talk about <clears throat> the different, the plethora of ballots that are out there. Um, those of us who go to vote, you know, you show up in your precinct and you get a ballot and you assume that it's pretty simple. Um, I'm going to pick on her here, my friend from Travis County, how many <laughs> ballot styles do you have just in Travis County, Texas for one election? It depends on the election, but a, a recent one 784. Okay, that's a single county, okay? Mm -hmm. a different thing, because you're in a different <laughs> mud or a different water district or a different school district or whatever it is. Well, okay, 10,000 jurisdictions, I, no, not all of them have 700 different forms, but you can imagine the scale of the problem now of getting the right sample ballot to the right person out of that. that that's, that's not a trivial matter and does need some work. What and are you that, hearing? And that voting assistance mm -hmm. officer, oh, first he, lieutenant, whose primary yeah. duty is to command a rifle platoon, right. has that as a collateral <laughs> duty, and he's supposed to be able to, to understand. He has, no, <laughs> he has no clue about that. What, what are you so, hearing? So let me tell you where this comes from. Yeah. So, I, so my firm is Lake Research Partners, and some of you know us from the work we do here in the U.S. Uh, we do opinion research, and a lot of it is on uh, election reform and voting rights here. Um, and so we tried to bring that expertise to bear. But on this project, we spent you know, 18 months or so uh, uh, doing an in-depth observation of what was actually happening with these voters overseas uh, and on military bases here in the U.S., who, who count as UOCAVA voters as well. So literally walking through the process with them, observing them as they filled out the forms and the ballots, talking to the voting assistance officers, which the military and, of course, the, uh, not, not a lot of people know there are civilian <laughs> voting assistance officers in the uh, embassies and consulates who are supposed to be helping the civilian voters, um, and the local election officials <laughs> as to what their experience was and how they were processing these ballots and how they were communicating with these voters. And basically we found like many of the same uh, challenges that existed 30, 40 years ago, even though there are incredibly, there's, there's an incredible amount of new, valuable, and extremely helpful resources. And, F and what we found is that those who connected, as Matt said, with the information that was available, either often through FVAP, and particularly in the military, they're getting it through FVAP, uh, and, and to a lesser degree, civilians who find it are, are getting that information through FVAP, or from their local election officials who are actually well informed about their own rules and really conscientious and wanting to assist and help these voters, um, but uh, not necessarily empowered to like uh, proactively reach out and find them and help them. It's more like when they get a question, they then respond. So the resources are there, and the internet is a, is a magic tool that uh, you know, people can access all kinds of information much more quickly than they used to be able to, and most voters overseas are connected uh, to the internet, but some major things missing uh, that make it, that keep these same, really they're the same essential obstacles, they're just in new forms because of the technology and the challenges that we have now. So nothing is prompting people to start this process. It is a longer process because you're overseas, uh, because you have to go through this request uh, for a ballot. Uh, well, you may have to register if you, haven't, if you weren't registered, and if you're a new, a 19-year-old soldier who's never registered before, you, may, you have, may have no idea how to go about that. 
um, register to vote. You have to request the ballot, which a, a citizen here does not have to do. Um, you, have to, you have to return it, re send that request in, get the ballot, and the ballot has to come back to you. You have to understand how to fill it out. You have to understand what the deadline is and send it back. So there's many steps in that process. If you start it early enough, there are many people along the way who are going to help you with that process, assuming you can access them. But if you don't start it early enough, you're in trouble. And even with things like the FWAB and, and sort of emergency, not, they're not applied consistently. People aren't all aware of it. Even those in the process who are supposed to be helping voters don't all, are not all aware of those tools or how to use them. So, um, so then uh, you get this scramble by those who are at least making the effort. And then there's a, who, a whole population of people who just never, never interact with the system. They never get to the point of even Oh, there's an, you know, they may hear about it, get super close to election time, and they get exposed to some U.S. media that say, oh, there's an election next week. Way too late, right, for them to do anything about it. So what's the trigger? What is it that tells them in January or February or even August, which would still be soon enough to, to request and go through this process? There isn't one. There isn't an automatic. Um, so that's, that's still a huge obstacle. Certainly the complexity. And as you noted, the fact that there are 3,000 jurisdictions. And again, the folks who work in those offices are, are trying to help. Uh, FAP is an, an amazing re resource now on their website, and they're connecting very effectively with those many local jurisdictions to get the accurate information to the particular voter for their rules and what they have to do. But, but there's no person who, who has a lot you know, it, there are a few at FAP if they know to call there. But there's no, you know, that voting assistance officer doesn't have all that information at their fingertips necessarily. Uh, and, uh, and so because it's not a standardized system, and that's just the way it is and going to be for quite a, for a while, it appears, um, you know, there isn't, uh, there's, there's, no simple, there's no simple message that can go to every voter and clarify, here are the exact steps. Well, here are the general steps, but it may be different in this county or different in this state. You have to go check that out. Uh, and that makes it harder, again, for someone who has many other things on their mind and many other uh, activities, priorities, particularly the, the military voters, uh, that they have to deal with, other challenges. And then, uh, as, as Matt suggested, there are, uh, uh, and this, this was one of the directions we, that's in our report. It's going to be public in a couple of months. I hope people will look at, read this, and, and see the reporting, reporting we do on, on these experiences that voters have, um, is that there is no, there's nothing that tells you uh, that it's working or not working. If you're, you, know, you, you might get uh, a, uh, some kind of notification back if you have a ballot, uh, if, you, if there was an error made in your request or if there's an error made in your ballot. If there's an error made in your ballot, you probably find out about it after the fact, if at all. So it's too late to fix it for that election. Two years from now, you might get it right or you might not. You might have forgotten. But if even in the, earlier in the process, if you've made an error, Maybe you get that information back in time. Uh, many, and it varies quite a bit, honestly, by county and state, how much effort they make to reach out and find the person. But when they do, they give them good information. But again, you're further down the line. There's less time to get the error fixed and actually uh, have it addressed. And nobody, almost nobody, with a few exceptions, there are a couple of counties and, and states that are doing this, uh, is getting just a normal confirmation that it did work. You, we did get your thing. We did get your ballot. Here's what the next step's going to be. We got your ballot request. Here's the next step. Here's what the timeline is. Look for it on such and such a date. If it doesn't show up, let us know. Right? They're not hearing that. Uh, and they're certainly not hearing, we got your ballot. It was counted. You voted successfully in this election. And to a person, I mean literally to a person, and we interviewed hundreds of people for this project, every one of them said, just, you know, Many of them brought it up on their own, but if they didn't, we would ask at the end, would, it, you, know, would you be interested in just having your local election official give you a confirmation? And abs every, every single one of them said that would make such a huge difference. They would have so much more confidence in the process. They would, um, and it, it in itself would serve as a prompt and a trigger for the next time that they know that they went through this and they have to go through this step again. So that initial notification is missing that the proactive uh, trigger that starts the process early enough so people can go through it and, and complete it successfully. Um, a simplification of the, the, the exchange of information that happens in between, and then that notification that could happen at the end, uh, you know, are in the recommendations that we issue from this, uh, and, and you know, from talking to certain people at every element of this process. And of course, the result is, in spite of excellent resources, many new efforts and new uh, tools that people have, we still have quite a few 
uh, you know, a substantial number of, of over, potential overseas voters who are never engaged, just never participate in any way in this process, and then quite a few who are trying to and, and failing. And, and I would say the last thing, the thing that we heard the most from the local election officials about why even voters who did go through the process, why they were not successfully counted, is um, they didn't sign the ballot. And most states and counties require a signature, some either on the ballot itself or on the envelope somewhere, and it's different, right? Lots of different rules. It's not, if I'm a voting assistance officer, I don't know exactly what to tell you about where it is. I have to look it up. But somewhere, most of these places require you to sign it or some way uh, sign an affidavit, something that says, yes, I'm this voter and this is me and, and count my vote. Um, and when that happens, and they're getting it a few days before the election, that, that vote is gone, so nothing's gonna happen. So, uh, and again, there's no, there's no feedback, there's no clarity to, um, no clarity of, of communication between the voter and those local election officials about that problem. So, a lot of things well, Let's wrong. talk so, about this. Even this. though these resources are great and yeah. available, okay. when people reach them, they usually get it right. Let's talk about these ballots, just so you get a sense of mm -hmm. what a local election officials yeah. run up against and, and what the overseas voter runs up against. Fortunately now, all states allow for the electronic transmission to the voter of an electronic ballot in some form or another, either as an attachment to an email or go to a website and download it for yourself. They all allow it through some way or another. However, most states don't allow you to send it back electronically. A few do. There's an experiment in Texas in one county. There's a couple other states that are allowing that to, to check in that out and see how it works, but most don't. And so. You're this overseas voter, <clears throat> and you get this email with some attachments. Well, if you're a military guy, getting it through a military system, the system probably stripped those attachments off for security <laughs> reasons. So you got this email back from your county administrator, and congratulations, here's your ballot, and you look down there and you see where these things used to be attached, and there's nothing there. And so you go back to your administrator and say, hey, they weren't there. And so she sends it again, and they still get stripped off. Well, the solution, and in fact, the um, <clears throat> Presidential Commission on Election Administration, which met last year and came out with a report, is now recommending that all states have a central place where the person can go and then download the stuff from a website, which doesn't go through the same email stripping things. And that would help to solve that. But... As any local election administrator will tell you, and the EAC data tells you, the number one reason that overseas ballots are rejected is what? They get there too late. About a third of them get rejected for just being too late. And that's a big problem because some states, they got to be there the day before the election, some on the day of the election, some five days after, some 10 days after. I don't know, is there one state longer than 10? I can't the ones, yeah, I Washington. Think. Washington. Yeah. Oh, Washington. Yeah. And so it's, it's widely varying as to about what it is. And then the number two reason was what we were just talking about, mm -hmm. some kind of a signature problem, either no signature or the signature didn't match. or The voters, by the way, almost you know, all of them said that the, filling out the ballot was the easiest part of the process, and they, they thought for sure they had absolutely made no errors in that, mm -hmm. even though the local election officials were telling us they actually make yeah. a lot of errors, usually the same error yeah. in that. I've, yeah. I've, again, one of my friend election right. administrators keeps this box of shame yeah. <laughs> of different forms of the of these ballots that they come back and some of them are done per if you don't realize it uh, an absentee ballot of course you know you fill out your ballot and then you put it in a security envelope that you sign and send it in well they don't send you the envelope they send you this piece of paper that's this little you know, electronically if, yeah you, yeah, you gotta it. you <laughs> gotta fold it and tape it and you do all the japanese paper stuff with uh -huh. it and a surprising number of people surrender on that well uh, and on that note i mean there's some very sort of basic issues sometimes with email of downloadable ballots mm -hmm. um, in europe many of you might know that the paper size is different uh, we don't use eight and a half by 11 paper in Greece where I live. Um, we use paper sizes called A4. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the ballot actually doesn't print properly on the paper. Mm -hmm. And um, and also I, I wanted to comment that um, if by chance your jurisdiction allows you to send your ballot back by some electronic means, including fax, which is still an option these days, um, many also require you to send the original ballot back as well with some kind of a deadline attached to the receipt of that original ballot. So uh, it, it's the variety 
of possibilities is really kind of I limitless. Think, I think if we get no lesson across to you that you take home with you is that it's complex. And if anybody comes up and says, I've got the answer, they're, they're kidding you. Right. Um, but I think that's one of the things to go away. You had uh, some? It, I mean, go back to the Lance Corporal at the forward operating base or at the outpost out there. He may have one of these things or mm -hmm. something very similar mm -hmm. to it. He may have an iPad thingy or whatever those things are called. You can see how technologically competent I am. Uh, and he may have access to some sort of militarized, uh, um, uh, what do you call it, laptop kind of computer. But he's not going to have a printer. So he can get his ballot over this, or he can get his ballot over the iPad thing, or he can get his ballot over the laptop, but he can't print it out. So he can't vote. Mm -hmm. Well, and the number two most common suggestion after I want a confirmation was, could it, and not this was not unanimous, there were some people who had concerns about it, but those who suggested it really felt strongly, why can't I just cast my ballot online? And of course that is for the most part not allowed. Uh, and, but for many people they see that as a way to cut through some of the complexity. Mm -hmm. um, but it would require obviously well, legislative the, you know, action. Yeah. The internet security guys, yeah. yep. they're, they're all over this and they're mm -hmm. saying no, we're not ready for electronic That's voting right. and I understand all of that. Yeah. Um, but some states are experimenting with electronic return of a ballot by limited populations under the assumption that, okay, it's hard for that guy, so we're going to allow this to happen. I know several states are doing this. Texas, one county, is doing this, and uh, I think a few hundred ballots came back that way, and we'll, we'll, you know, we're still learning about these things. But, but this is one of those things that has to happen. You had something you wanted to yeah, well, we, we David talked a little bit about these, these natural triggers that those of us who live you know, in the United States with the voting communities. Um, and so what we're trying to do based on, on what David and his team came back with is, is not recreate those triggers in terms of a natural environment, but actually taking a look at how we can assist those triggers. So one of the things is, is this whole idea of military members um, somehow believe that their local election officials know where they are. Um, and we know that military members actually need to tell you guys um, who are election officials where you are. Um, so what we've created is this trigger when they naturally go to one of the DOD systems to, act, to change their address for a personnel reason or for their medical records reason, um, we have created a pop-up that comes up that says, if this address that you just changed in the system um, would affect where your voting materials go, um, it will send you a link to fapp.gov where you can fill out a new FPCA um, and send that to your local election official. Um, so that's one of the examples where we're talking about, you know, using some of these uh, trigger points. Um, in addition, um, since we are able to contact our active duty military members, um, is to send them emails. You know, we send them emails um, to say, you know, either, you know, 30, 60, 90 days out from the election, as well as, you know, our special emphasis weeks, you know, absentee voter week, armed forces voter week. And so we're trying to create these natural environments where people just stop for a second and say, hey, listen, I need to pause and act. Um, but again, and, and I think Judy even touched on this, um, is what is the level of interest? And if, if one of the things that keeps me up at night is this whole idea of, of no matter what we do, and I'm really glad that we're sitting up here talking about the challenges, um, because we, and what I don't want to have, have missed is there are plenty of successes. And I know that David talked to plenty of people overseas and plenty of military members Absolutely. who, who felt really great about support. the process, Absolutely. great unit voting yeah. assistance officers. Absolutely. But that doesn't help this conversation. What helps this conversation is let's talk about what may not be working. Mm -hmm. um, but to, to be able to, to, to recreate those things and to, to do these in, in some sort of natural way, I think will, will really help. Um, and those are the types of things. Um, training, for example. Um, FAP has been doing training for years to our local election officials based on, you know, here's the UACAVA laws, here's what you should be doing. We're training our voting assistance officers, so not just the one-day course, but they have an online course now. We go out personally to them. But we're adding a third element um, for the 2016 election cycle, and it's really this reach out direct to the voter. Um, and we're trying to do it on their terms. We aren't going to create a 45-minute training session 
um, that's going to go well, get us nowhere. Right. So we're creating these little short video snippets, and we're taking all the lessons learned in terms of what are the most common mistakes, um, how can we make this process easier, and we're creating a suite of voter assistance materials aimed directly at the voters. Um, and as Kamanzi said, with our relationship with the council of state governments, hoping to come out with best practices and recommendations for our state and locals to, to, to so that they can see how they can help navigate this process as well. So we really are taking to heart some of these ideas of, of trigger points and the idea that our voters um, think that everything might be going perfectly when we know from our election officials um, that that's not necessarily the case. And I would just like to interject something here on behalf of overseas citizens as well that in terms of trigger points. Um, for an overseas citizen there is a, a a lack of trigger points mm -hmm. because you know we're not connected to um, the DOD and serving in the military and in many cases uh, we may be exposed to completely different discourse about American elections, um, America in general and I think um, I have to say for those American citizens who who do vote in elections in the United States you know good for you because um, I did some research that suggested that Americans overseas in many cases experience a lot of really negative things, uh, a lot of uh, anti-American sentiment, things like this. And they're still um, wanting to go through this process, which is very difficult and time consuming, and wanting to cast their ballot because they are American citizens and it is their right. And um, so I think um, we should try to do all we can to help the people who want to vote. Um, and, and I hope that we all continue to do that. And I think in that, in that and Judy brings up, I think, a, a, a great point. I think we should concentrate on our, our, all of our efforts on those people who want to vote. And that certainly is, is our, our mantra at FAP. Um, for those people who want to vote, we want to make sure that they are aware of those resources and that they're there for them. Um, that, that's what, again, keeps me up at night, is I want to make sure that those people are the ones that have the information that they need. Let me throw a wrinkle into this now. Oh, Don. <laughs> <laughs> the elections that we're talking about are the usual elections where you go to a booth and cast your ballot or an absentee ballot. Anybody here from Iowa? <laughs> How do they handle presidential primaries in Iowa? It's a caucus. Now... Rob, how do we do that with an overseas voter? Well, right now, <laughs> you better get, a, better get an airplane ticket. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. You've got to get an airplane ticket fast. Um, and uh, that would be pretty expensive to fly everyone back for the caucuses. Um, so uh, just to step back for a moment, uh, I just wanted to say, just listening to this and really important conversation, and, uh, is, is that what we're hearing is, is that when the system's under stress, there's, there's things that that really get exposed um, in, in a way that ways that solving them would really help all of us, um, and 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 that 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 that's uh, you know part of the reason that's so important for this conversation is helping really people that need uh, uh, this assistance to 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 be able to uphold the right to vote, but something that would certainly help all of us. And you think about um, the 19-year-old who who never registered to vote. Well. You know, almost half of uh, all of our 19-year-olds haven't been registered to vote. They've just been in our schools, and like you know, can't we make a commitment to get everyone registered to vote before they leave the schools? Um, uh, you know, and uh, getting information about candidates. So it's pretty hard to get information about candidates, but couldn't we, in the modern world, figure out a way uh, that there's really good? You know, we'd have to put money into it, but you know, very good online voter education about our ballot choices. Um, so getting back to the caucuses. We've, uh, earlier today, we, we raised this uh, uh, value that we think is a general value of, of, of a ranked choice ballot. Um, and, and there's a particular application of the ranked choice ballot that's already in use for, for overseas voters. Um, there are, uh, last year, um, during uh, congressional elections, um, five states that had runoffs mm -hmm. with a round that was pretty close to the first round, uh, like the Mississippi runoff, where um, that, that Croc uh, Cochran won, that narrow race. That was only three weeks after the first round. Um, and that's, uh, that 21 days is obviously much shorter than the, the number of days you, sh you should be able to send a, a ballot out to an overseas voter. Yeah, you all remember, know that the, the rule is 45 days. Mm -hmm. the local election officials have to have ballots prepared and ready to go 45 days prior to the election 
period. That's the law. And this is something that's, that's working. Like yes. They actually, those ballots are going. Yeah, that took a, yeah. took a couple right. of legislative Which cycles. To be true, but right, it took it a couple of legislative be, yeah. cycles for states to get everything in place. But that's not a problem for right For a now. normal, regular election, yeah. those ballots are going out 45 right. days before, which right. should be enough time for most right. people. So the Mississippi yeah. ballot went out 45 yeah. days before the first round, um, and the uh, overseas voter got a ballot in which they could rank their choices. Um, they sent that ballot back, uh, uh, we hope, um, and, and, and they, um, that ballot, it, in, in the event of a runoff, the ranked choice ballot can, can, can be that that it reflects the intention of the voter. We talked about you know, having backup choices. So if so, your first choice isn't in the runoff, your ballot's going to count so for, yeah, for, 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 for your second choice. So uh, five states did that. Uh, South Carolina uh, has, has done it for years. Louisiana, the longest period of time. They do it for about 10,000 out-of-state military and, uh, and all overseas voters. Um, it's been hard to get a lot of data. And they're getting good results. Well, good. I, I'd like to hear whatever numbers you have. I know that in no, South I'm Carolina. Asking. Oh, it's a question. Right. I don't I, know. I have been, it's been hard to find numbers. The one that has provided them is South Carolina, where they said more than 90% of those ballots coming back end up counting in the runoff, which is actually a very high retention for all of us, because runoff elections in general, the turnout usually goes down by about a third mm -hmm. by people who don't come back to vote. Um, so getting back to our caucuses. So um, in the presidential primaries, um, and it's not just the caucuses, it's, 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 it's the, the primary season is, is this for concentrated time. And um, so you have the New Hampshire uh, primary sort of set in, etched in stone that we will always vote, you know, Iowa and then New Hampshire and so on. Um, and uh, it's not etched in stone, but it, it, it seems like it is. So um, then candidates drop out rapidly. Um, and so by the time that, so this year or next year, March 1st, there's going to be a whole slew of states that vote on March 1st. And all of those people that vote um, will have gotten a ballot with a whole lot of candidates that will have dropped out by March 1st. And so you have a ballot. You may send your ballot back relatively promptly because um, you have a strong opinion about it and you, vote, and you vote for one person. And if that person is dropped out, that's it. And actually, we looked at the numbers. Paul, Paul Gronke and I did an op-ed about this. And, 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 and we looked at the, the numbers. And the overseas votes are disproportionately, pretty significantly, voting for people who have dropped out. So that if that ballot, if that had been a ranked choice ballot that they sent back and your first choice has dropped out, then your ballot could count for your first viable choice that's um, still in the race. Um, and actually, a couple states have, 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 there's bills that have just been put in to, 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 to do that. And we expect several others to, to, to take a look at that policy. Now, that's a state policy because it's a primary. But um, for caucuses, it's just a party rule. Um, and, and, and so parties in, say, Iowa, um, could be saying we, we welcome, we, we want the contributions of, of all of our voters, and if there would be some sort of validation process that the, the party would have to figure out for, for an overseas voter. But that voter would be able to send back their ranked choice ballot. Um, and in a caucus, like in Iowa, it, it's uh, particularly on the Democratic side, it's actually like a moving around experience, right? You, you have your first choice, and if your first choice can't get any delegates, you go over to your next choice. And that's obviously hard to simulate if you just send back one uh, ballot with a single choice. But if you sent back a ranked choice ballot, then your ballot basically simulates that activity. If your first choice doesn't win anything at the caucus, then it goes to your second choice. Um, and so that's on the parties themselves. There's a number of key contests, I, Iowa obviously the most important one, but a lot of really important caucuses where we think the parties have a right well, they obviously have the ability to do this or the right to do it, and they, we feel an obligation to do it. And, and, and so that's, that's a suggestion. I mean, otherwise, really, a lot of these overseas voters are just disenfranchised from that. And that's a pretty important election, the nomination Absolutely. for president. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, people get to the end and they complain they only have two choices. Well, they have a lot more choices in the primaries, but if they're not able to vote in that primary or not vote effectively for someone who's actually still running. Well, and I would suspect yeah. that that type of system, a ranking system, would not be unfamiliar because, you know, in European countries, they use many more alternative voting systems that are similar to that. So, um, you know. Yeah. Well, that's like the that's long term residents, right? Many of them, mm -hmm. the civilians, may well be familiar mm -hmm. with these other alternatives, and, and it might be easier for them in some ways to adjust than the domestic voters. I think for the military voters, it again, would be again most of them are, yeah. are young first time voters anyway, so there's, it's, it's just the challenge of getting them into the process in the mm -hmm. first place. And, and I think. Yeah. We can affect that or impact upon that demographic, if you will, because we own them. 
Sure. Yeah, we've got them. You know they belong to us. We know where they are and can train them. And I, you know, I've been retired. I've been retired. I've been retired for 14 yeah. years, but I believe uh -huh. every member of the U.S. military has a military email address. Yes, or if they don't, they can have. So all of these triggers, Matt, that you were talking about, could be hit, and an email sent to that young soldier, that young sailor, that young marine out there, to impact upon his or her tendency or inclination to vote. They also get a leave and earning statement every month, and it tells them how much money they made, what their pay was, what's been deducted, you know, and all, and how much, how many days of leave they still have on the books they can take. We used to get it in paper. I think they get it online now. But I'm it's still sure. available both online yeah. and paper. But you could put those triggers on the leave and earning statement. Hey, in your state, you know, Lance Corporal Smith, you've got a local election coming up in your district, or did I, you need to register now and, and go to such and such to do it sort of thing. And, and, we, and we do that. Yeah. Um, so we still like use I those say, I've been retired earnings. for 14 yeah. years, Matt. I'm behind still do it. <laughs> but, but that technology can address this issue and make it easier for all the people we're talking about up here to vote. Yes, I understand all the issues with security and, and validating the signature and all that sort of thing, but technology is there. The electronic ballot is out there now. It, you know, I think eventually we will get to that point. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's about time to go. Um, There's a but, fellow but with a, his hand. <laughs> thank you for... Uh, <laughs> Thank you for, for sticking around. I, I think this is the important, or, or, or an important thing. And as Rob pointed out, and this is true in a lot of things, when we solve a problem for the most disadvantaged people of our population, we find that we inadvertently solve the problem for a larger group. And like I say, this is the, the, handling our overseas voters uh, puts an, a, a tremendous amount of stress on the system, and that's when you find out when it doesn't work exactly right, and so you correct those things. And so I think this is something that's good. What's the answer? Well, the answer is, from my point of view, is to get every state to do it exactly the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to see you on that? <laughs> <laughs> What's the likelihood of that happening? No, but, but there are some common things, and I think from what Kamanzi's telling us, is that the states are generally on board with trying to come up with the right answer, and of course every state has its own ideas. But you all go back into the states, uh, hang on, you all go back into the states and you can have a chance to talk to them. And my ex experience with state legislators is that they're generally welcome to this kind of interest group lobbying. This, you're not the lobby group that they're, oh my God, they're coming down again. This is the kind that they want to deal with. And there's usually in every state legislature that one or two or three legislators who are the champion of this, sure. who are the ones that gather everybody around. You just need to find out who those are. You had a, a question? Absolutely. I'm Christopher, and I'm actually a native of Sterling Heights, Michigan. Ah. It's great to see somebody else from there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm an American who's lived abroad quite a bit um, in a few other continents, and um, it strikes me as a fascinating idea. You guys have so much to share. It's such a fascinating concept what the French Republic does. It has members of parliament who represent French people abroad. Yeah. <laughs> You, yeah, you, if I, quick, if I could just quickly address that we, okay. we we heard this from more from more than you know several yeah. voters who we were mostly civilians who we were talking to overseas the long term people who are living long term and some of them had observed as you have that other countries do it differently and why can't we have someone representing us as overseas voters um, but I think it requires a constitutional change yeah. so it's yeah. not so yeah. easy yeah. right yeah. Uh, that's a great discussion yeah. item and, and, and there's yeah. lots of things yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> just, anyway. Just, a, just a very quick add to that I, I, I just I just have to say that you know there's about four million people who live in Puerto Rico Guam and uh, Samoa and uh, they actually uh, citizens and if they move here they can uh, you know 
vote immediately as soon as um, they have residency, but they can't vote for president. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if we move there and take and become residency, we you can't, we, you can't vote. A Uokava voter. That's that's the one place in the world you can't move. Is that part of America? <laughs> you can't move to Puerto um, Rico. And so there are some uh, other deeper conversations yeah, we yeah. need to keep having. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Chip's going to close it down here, but um, we're going to be moving to another little quick venue here to uh, have a little reception, and, and I hope that uh, we can engage into a little bit more detailed conversation about some of these detailed things. I think this is important stuff, and I think we need to keep that uh, and remind ourselves about this. Chip. Well, I want to thank the panel. Uh, I think we all had some good uh, good insights into some of the problems. I'm a Yoakaba voter, so I care about this, um, and have been a Yoakaba voter for a while. So it's uh, it's it's getting better, but it's not fixed entirely yet. Um, I want to thank all of you for putting in a long day. Uh, I know it's been a long day, but um, hope hopefully you've benefited from the. Uh, plethora of speakers that we've had. We've had lots of different formats, lots of different subjects, and uh, I guess we just say um, Summit 2016 will be about the same time of the year next year, and uh, we hope to see all of you and for you to bring friends and <coughs> colleagues along with you. So and, with and, that, and, I think... And tomorrow's workshops. Uh, oh, t yeah, tomorrow's workshops are over at Winston and Strawn's uh, building on the 12th floor of 1700 K, which is kind of the corner of 17th and K. And uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you at the reception and, uh, and perhaps before having Before we get away, um, I want to thank the panelists for all of their thank you. And you got it? Okay, good. Actually, we had just wanted to, um, the three co-hosts here, say a few words. I know Chip already sure. said a sure. few. Um, sorry, there is a microphone. So I don't mean to keep you long. I just thought we'd each say a last few words um, because it's just, boy, it's such an amazing day and we have to say a, a really uh, heartfelt goodbye. Um, and I just also wanted to say that, you know, two years ago when I was thinking about Summit again, uh, I discussed with our board the fact that I felt we really needed to reinvent it. And um, we started on a process of doing that. The first thing we wanted to do was to bring other organizations in. And the second thing was to really change the format. I think this year we've, you know, it took us a little while, bit by bit, but we've really gotten a new kind of energy in the room. And it's just been, I think, an amazing day trying it out. Um, there weren't too many tumbles. I almost fell once, um, but nobody to really totally fell off the stage, only halfway at one point, someone over there. Um, but it's been really well choreographed, all in all, I would say. Um, and it's going to take some time for it to sink in for all of us, you know? All this information we got today is quite a lot. But I want to thank you. Uh, for being with us and for being so brave to go through this day with us today. <laughs> I'd also like to give a chance to um, Chris Fields here to say her goodbyes. And of course, we'll say hello again, but the you know, next one over a glass of wine. <laughs> okay, Chris, please. Thank you, Susan. So I am the pinch hitter for the Lawyers Committee. I'm the, usually the person that works behind the scenes. Um, my colleague, Marcia Johnson Blanco, had to leave for uh, her daughter's recital. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Chris Melody Fields Figueredo. I'm the manager of legal mobilization and strategic campaigns at the Lawyers Committee. Um, you might hear me on a conference call or get an email from me. I'm usually, again, I don't like to be um, out in front. Um, but. I just wanted to, to leave a couple of you know thoughts that I have um, collected through the day. Um, so the three things that I would take away from today are impressions, inspiration, and how that um, uh, increases participation. Um, impressions. Um, earlier um, during um, the Lawyers Committee panel, 
Tom Hicks talked about how he likes um, to take it. He, he likes to take his kids to the congressional office um, and um, took them out to vote. And when Vanessa Cardenas um, was up, she talked about how um, you know new citizens really take the citizenship process and the the, the pride they feel um, they feel um, through that process and the first time they vote. I can remember the first time um, my own mother, um, who is Venezuelan, um, going through the citizenship process with her um, and um, quizzing her um, so she could. Uh, prepare for the test and taking her um, to vote for the first time, the impression that left on us. And I think as advocates, all of us that are working in this space, we need to think about the impressions that we make on voters, the, the decisions we make, um, the policies that we put forward, um, what impression that is um, going to leave on a voter um, to increase participation and, and make them a lifetime voter. Um, inspiration, I've been inspired this entire day. I don't think um, people would think that the Lawyers Committee Fair Vote, U.S. Vote Foundation, and Overseas Vote Foundation um, were sort of unlikely players putting together a conference together. You know, we all work in this space, but we work in this space very differently. Um, and we have different perspectives. And I th what I've been really impressed throughout this entire day is how we've brought all these different perspectives together. You know, we're all working in this space together. And I think it's really important for us to learn from each other, um, because if we keep doing the same thing that we've always been doing, um, we're not going to do uh, inspire and, and increase in um, participation. And you know, this whole summit is about what we learned from this past election with the low um, participation in our um, election and what we need to do to inspire, um, to leave an impression on voters to increase participation. So thank you so much on behalf of the Lawyers Committee. Thank you to our, our co-hosts. It's been a really great day. And tomorrow, we begin the work, um, mm -hmm. the workshops. Well, I could just say amen. I mean, uh, if, if I guess pinch hitting means you often have a great hitter. And, uh, and so, but anyway, both of you, uh, thanks so much. Um, I want to echo those, those remarks. This has been videotaped, and, I, and it ultimately will be all available. Um, and so if there's parts you want to rewind and look over or share with people, that'll uh, be available. Um, and um, really, just such an, a terrific number of speakers came. I just want to express my gratitude both to my co-hosts um, for all the work um, that they've done, but also for all the people that came and all the speakers that gave us their time and uh, great insights and a lot to think about and um, look forward to the reception. So thank you. <laughs>